From the Ear to Their Travel Studio, this is the Ear to Their Disney Podcast. The Ear to Their Podcast, it's time to start the show. Be sure to hold on tight, here we go. Exploring all the different Disney destinations. Ear to Their, it's time to start the fun. Now grab a drink, grab a snack, and as a famous mouse once said, On with the show. Once I was in line for a quick service restaurant at the Magic Kingdom, and I saw a young boy, maybe about three or four years old, with his dad. And the young boy was completely melting down, crying, whining, lying on the floor, losing his mind. His dad, in a very honest and very funny moment, not for him, but for me, looked at his son and very, very seriously, his three or four-year-old son, he looked at and said, buddy, you've got to pull yourself together. And I can remember laughing to myself and thinking, man, this kid is exhausted. He's beat. And they're going to, he and his family are going to try to keep going today. That looks like a rookie mistake to me. So that is what inspired this week's topic, the biggest rookie mistakes in Walt Disney World. Here to talk about those mistakes is the founder and head honcho over at theworldofwalt.com and the voice you know from the World of Walt podcast. He was a rookie to Walt Disney World way back in the days of the Mickey Mouse Review, which has since been retired from two different Disney parks. Herb Leibacher, welcome back to the show. Phil, it's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And I don't think I've ever been called a honcho before. <laughs> and I also want to point out that I have earned every one of my silver hairs. They're not gray. They're silver. Just um, so you know. I heard by here. I, I've had those silver hairs since I was in high school. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me as a person. I'm not quite sure. But yeah, I, listen, I mean, if you could see my hair, <laughs> you would notice that it was pretty white. And I'm, you know, not even 38 years old. So I'm, I'm you know, bald and gray at like 19. It was awesome. <laughs> it's a good way to hide it, actually. It, it is. Yeah, it really is. All right. So one thing that I, I really wanted to do this topic with you because you are, a, you know, you're a local. You see this kind of stuff all the time. You see people, and I know you make a mental note of those people when you're in the park. You see them making some kind of a mistake, and you're like, ah, if they only would have done this, if they, they only would have done that and thought more about the trip or plan, you know, there are so many mistakes you can make as a first time or even second, third or fourth time visitor to Walt Disney World. It's really hard to make them. You kind of have, or hard not to make them. Excuse me. You kind of have to know what you're doing. And I'm going to get the shameless plug out of the way really quickly because I don't want to mention it during the entire podcast that I think honestly, and I'm pushing myself a little bit here, but if you don't know what you're doing, you should always contact someone who does uh, Disney specialized travel agent, whether it's me or it's not me. I think that help that'll help you get rid of, you know, or avoid a lot of these. As I was saying, I'm sure you see this all the time with people making all kinds of mistakes and and everything in the parks. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. It's something where there is help out there. And so I think calling a travel agent is a great way to get that help. It's it's personalized. And if you call it, you're their travel, it's expert and free. Uh, but don't don't just go in blind, and we'll be talking about some of that. But yeah, it, it's easy to make those mistakes because a, a Disney vacation is a big deal. It's it's a lot of time, it's a lot of expense. Uh, there's sometimes a lot of pressure because people say we will have the most magical time of our lives. So being ready for it is important. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many people that I've I've had who I've helped plan their trips, and this has happened to me uh, quite a few times, where I'll help them plan, and then I say, okay, you have to make your um, fast, fast reservations here. You have to do this here. You have to do that. And they say, no, we're going to, we're going to, you know, take it by, play it by ear. No, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> anyway, we're going to get into the, to all that. So, um, all right. So our top rookie mistakes that you shouldn't make and Herb, since you are the guest and since I'm not ready to go first yet, <laughs> you can go first with your first one. <laughs> all right. You can process in the background. Yeah, right. Okay, so first one I'm going to say, and and it pains me a little bit to say it because I probably would be one who falls into this category, don't plan too much. And so I like to 
to compare a trip to Walt Disney World to a trip to Europe. So if you're going to go to Europe, there are probably a lot of things you want to do and see. But what you probably don't want to do is saying, we're going to go to the Louvre on Thursday at four o'clock. And for seven and a half minutes, I will look at the the paintings. And only after seven and a half minutes will I move on. So what if you want to spend four minutes or what if you want to spend 10 minutes? I think some people kind of with my personality get out their spreadsheets and do all their planning and everything is down to the minute. Don't plan too much. And I know that kind of goes against a lot of the other things we're probably going to talk about because there are a lot of things you do need to plan. But I think it is possible to go overboard and squeeze all of the fun out of it. Now, now that said, um, some people love their spreadsheets and I'm, I'm raising my hand right now as if you can see it. Uh, but I, I think you need to be careful not to plan too much because Disney has a good way of providing opportunities for interesting things to happen and you don't want to miss them just because the next line on your spreadsheet says your your time is up and you have to move on. So this may be kind of an oddball in this list, but I do think it's possible to plan too much and be careful not to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you there. I think micromanaging every detail of your trip is a bad idea. You need to leave some time in there for, like you were saying, those things that will happen around you that you're not really expecting that, you know, if, for instance, the trolley show was coming down Main Street USA, or, by the way, Herb, I don't know if you saw, uh, recently, the Muppet Mobile Lab has been making another appearance at Epcot. I know, I right. have to go track there that down. So, I love the Muppet Mobile Lab. I know, and I know we talked about that, I think it was on one of your podcasts, but if, you, if you're walking through Epcot and there's the Muppet Mobile Lab, and your spreadsheet says you have to get to mission space in three minutes you're not gonna be able to stay and see it so i think you're right i think and that's why this, the fast pass window is great because it gives you an hour so you don't have to get there at a, at a certain time you know for some of the shows you only get 15 minutes to show up but most of the attractions you have that hour so you have the, the little bit of time a little bit of wiggle room to do that kind of stuff another thing here is you don't want to feel like your vacation's a lot of work right like you're going to relax to have fun with your friends and family if you're walking around constantly looking down at, okay, this is what we have to do now. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to do this. You're not going to have as much fun. It just isn't going to be that experience. Like you were saying, you you, you want that magical experience, but you're not going to get it if you're constantly staring at your schedule. And the last thing I wanted to say about that was, if you have kids, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> forget trying to plan your day down to the minute. It's not going to happen. You're going to get tantrums. You're going to have kids who are exhausted from walking. You're going to have kids who just, I mean, my kids are, and I, I brag about them all the time, and I'm sorry, people were tired of hearing it. My kids are good. They really are. I'm very, I'm super impressed whenever we take them out with how good they are. But that being said, they've thrown tantrums in the middle of the park, and there's nothing you can do about it. They're going to, you're going to want to go to lunch, and they're going to say, I want to do the carousel, and they're going to be stuck. And they're going to, mm -hmm. and, you know, you, you can't, it's, with little kids especially, you can't, you know, manage or micromanage every detail. So I completely agree with your, with your first one. That's completely true. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think it takes a little bit of pressure off. So if you don't have this, this spreadsheet to-do list, must check every item, must stick to every schedule point, it allows you to relax a little bit and, and you don't have to say, oh, no, we are three and a half minutes behind. We are doomed. It, it, it's not the case. You're on vacation. You can loosen up a little bit, be a little bit flexible. You'll be thankful that you you do that. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. All right. So from OK, so on to my first one. Here's one that's kind of it's one that because I think Disney gets a bad rap and it, or it had in the past. Well, Disney World, especially in the the quote unquote theme park food. And I think only eating the theme park type food is a big time rookie mistake. I understand you're there. You want to, you want to save time. You want to get to headliner to headliner to, you know, every attraction to every show. You're not going to get to everything, right? So you might as well go and enjoy some of the better food options that Walt Disney World has to offer. If you think it's all chicken nuggets and burgers and pizza, you're, you're wrong. It's not like that anymore. Uh, I keep saying on this podcast all the time that Disney has upped their game significantly when it comes to the, the food that is offered. Uh, some of my, my all-time favorite meals have been in Walt Disney World. I mean, I mentioned on the podcast before, I was blown away by how good Be Our Guest is in the Magic Kingdom 
I didn't expect it to be that good. I didn't expect my steak to be that good. I didn't expect the, and I'm not a meat and cheese tray kind of guy, but we got that for an appetizer. I loved it. I, and you know, of course it's me. You top it off with that Chimay blue beer. That was fantastic. (laughs) It's nice to walk out of magic kingdom after you have a drink or two at dinner. I'd like when I'm on vacation, I'd like to do that. I'd like to have a drink or two with my dinner. We're with lunch if it's a stressful day, <laughs> but uh, I like that option that you have at the Magic Kingdom at be our guest to do that. Uh, there's a lobster top burger. Come on, not lobster top burger. That's phenomenal. And then I've had really honestly maybe the best piece of fish I've ever had in my life was the mahi mahi at uh, the Coral Reef in Epcot. That being said, you have to kind of get past the idea of eating a fish while there are fish watching you. It's kind of a weird, <laughs> like you're sitting there eating and you're like, oh my, I remember telling my wife, I was like, this is phenomenal. And then I look at the tank and I'm like, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is your cousin, but you know, yeah. it's, it's too bad. You kind of feel bad. You're just like, e- well, you know, sorry. He probably had other plans today, but now he's on my plan. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really think if you go into, go on your trip to Walt Disney World and you, only hit the counter service, you know, hot dogs and burgers and, and, you know, Casey's Corner, which I love. I think you're going to regret it. I think they have a much, much better uh, array of food than you may think. So that's one that I think you really should avoid. You, you are absolutely right. And I do think that Disney has upped their game. I, I think part of it is them trying to get ahead of the curve and making sure that they have some, some more variety and healthier options. It, it seems like maybe there's this war on sugar or war on fat these days. And so I think Disney's trying to get ahead of that a little bit. But they also know that when people go on vacation, they enjoy eating new and different and delicious food. And I think there are many options there. So I love the ribs at um, Flame Tree Barbecue if you go to to um, Disney's Animal Kingdom. And and if you're a foodie, there are a lot of signature restaurants with a lot of amazing options. And so I I had an opportunity once to go to Victoria and Albert's with my wife. And so if you are celebrating a birthday that ends in a zero or a special wedding anniversary, it is an extremely expensive outing and you have to be kind of one who will enjoy a stuffy, not stuffy, but formal atmosphere. Um, But you can have one of the best meals of your life at Walt Disney World, if you go to a place like Victoria and Albert's, very pricey, but very nice. So it's not all about burgers and fries. There are a lot of different options um, from simple things like waffles with Nutella. I'm looking at you, Sleepy Hollow in the Magic Kingdom to to fancy stuff. So uh, open up your your mind and your palate to some of the options. You'll be glad you did. Yeah, they won't let me in Victoria and Albert's. I tried to come with my you know, Iron Man t-shirt and my shorts. And <laughs> No, not really. They, as long as you have a tie with your Iron Man t-shirt, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. They, with my goofy tie on top of my Iron Man t-shirt. <laughs> now they, you know what? I haven't gotten a chance to eat there. It, it's something that is definitely on my bucket list. And I surprised my wife with a uh, Disney cruise with our kids, not just the two of us or people at home for you, for that one listener right now. I was like, Oh my God, you're going on a Disney cruise without your kids. No, we're taking my kids for my wife's 40th birthday. Uh, we're taking a cruise to the uh, Bahamas on the new, the newly reimagined Wonder. So I'm really, really super excited about that. But I thought about doing it just the two of us and doing a few days in Walt Disney World and then the cruise uh, and surprising her with Victoria and Albert and stuff. But then I realized, you know what? She's not going to want to do this stuff without the kids. So mm. yeah, we're bringing the kids. And it's going to be their first Disney cruise. I'm super excited about it. But yeah, the the food. You know, in Walt Disney World, yeah, you got to you got to give it a shot. You got to go to places, like you said, Herb. If you have the cash to go to Victoria and Alberts, by all means, I it apparently is not only one of the not only the top restaurant in Walt Disney World, it's often got gotten like praises the the top restaurant in Florida. I mean, people say that's number one down there. So, yeah, if you have the money, give it a shot. I think that's a really cool one. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of the the best restaurants in in the state, and and probably one of the top ones in in the U.S. So yeah, so it, it's definitely not just hamburgers and fries. There's a whole world of food at Walt Disney World. I'd actually like to see what they could do with hamburgers and fries there. You know what I mean, <laughs> just like hey, one night at at Victoria and Albert's, you just tell the chef I forget the guy's name, the head chef there. Say, hey, listen, Hummel. there you go. Listen tonight, burgers, hot dogs, French fries. 
you know, popcorn. Get get going. We can, I'm sure it would be phenomenal and probably $180 for a plate, but it, I'd love but to see to, it try. It has to be able to have a French name and a wine pairing. So I, I think those that. are two important things. Yeah. Wine from a wine from a box for the burger. That would work out pretty well. <laughs> okay. They are going to throw you out of the curtain. <laughs> That's true. So. <laughs> yeah, all right, Aaron, I think yeah, you're up right for your next one. Okay. Next one for me. So my, my first one was planning too much. My, my companion to that is going to be planning too little. So let's go back to the example of uh, a trip to Europe. You wouldn't get off the plane in Brussels and, and walk out and say, hey, what's there to do around this continent? Uh, you, you need to put a little bit of planning in uh, because otherwise you're, you're going to be a, a bit lost and overwhelmed. So I think you want to consider what is it that you you like? Um, do you like sports? Are, are you into shows, into attractions, um, spa visits? Think about the things that you and your family and your traveling companions like. And there's a pretty good chance there's a, a a spattering of those sorts of things to do at Walt Disney World. I think it's important to have a game plan. So you were talking about um, being um, the fact that I'm a local. You, you see folks all the time. And, and this is the one that breaks my heart. So people um, are at the Magic Kingdom. They just got through the Ticket and Transportation Center. They've taken the monorail over to the Magic Kingdom. They are through the gates and they are uh, standing on Main Street and saying, um, well, what are we going to do? Uh, wait, this map, is, am I holding this upside down? I, I'm not sure. Well, wait, yeah, I got to wait 20 minutes. For it. And so they have no clue what they are in for. Uh, you wouldn't go to Europe with no clue what you're in for. Spend a little bit of time getting ready. Now, again, that doesn't mean you have to have the spreadsheets and plan out every minute. But do you know which park you're going to go to each day so that you can take advantage of setting up some fast passes? Do you know what the must-haves are for the people in your party? You, you can go there with too little planning and that just as much as too much planning, I think it creates a lot of pressure. I think too little planning can create a lot of animosity because then people are like, well, I, I want to do this. No, I want to do that. Don't waste your time standing in the middle of Main Street USA with that sort of a discussion. Do that before you get there. So you've got some idea of what you're going to do. You have to do some level of planning. Yeah. As a custodial cast member or former custodial cast member, that was the family I looked for every day. I'd, <laughs> I'd look for the family that were all huddled around one guide map yeah. and just kind of not knowing, like they were just trembling, like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. Where do we go? Where do we go? Now, this was before Fast Pass Plus, but I, you know, you'd walk up to them and say, hi, you know, what, what can I help you with? What can I help you find? What are you looking to do? That's, you're exactly right. You have to figure out at least a little bit. You have to have the bare bones ideas of, which parks you're going to be in on which days, which fast passes you're going to get. You get three fast passes a day. If you're staying on property, you can book them 60 days at, sixty days in advance of your trip. If you're staying off property, you book it 30 days in advance of your trip. Uh, you can book your tours. You can book tea times for golf. You can book special events tickets. You can buy the tickets. You actually have to buy them in advance. You make your dining reservations 180 days before your trip, no matter if you're staying on property or not. These are just the, the things that I think you need to have in place before you go. You don't, like we say, you don't need everything micromanaged down to the minute. But if you make your dining reservations, if you plan, if, you know, if you're planning on eating in table service restaurants, if you have your fast passes booked, you know, your three per day, and then there's a rolling fast pass after that, which usually works pretty well, where after you're done with your three fast passes, you can use your smartphone. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. Or you can go to one of the kiosks there and playing your next fast pass. And sometimes there's not great availability with that rolling fast pass, but you can get the shows and stuff later in the day. It's pretty nice to be able to do that. But these are the things you have to look at. Uh, you know, you don't like we, we were saying earlier, you don't want to be, you know, crazy over prepared, but if you don't prepare enough, you are going to be that family on main street with that map and kind of, okay, well, like you said, our 20 minutes for this and 10 minutes for this. And what should we go to? And trekking from, from Tomorrowland, and you look at your look at the app on your phone. Then it, you know Jungle Cruise is a ten minute wait, so you'll have to go all the way over to Adventureland. That's not a good use of your time. You want to at least have an idea of what you're doing. I think. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and this, uh, I'll I'll give you another plug here. This is where I think a travel agent can really <laughs> yeah. help because you you've got that list of these top five or seven or whatever things that are the must dos. So which park on which day? Your fast pass, your advanced dining reservation, your your special event tickets. So you know these things to ask where other people might not know them. And I think the list you you ticked off there was, was the the perfect list. Those are kind of the the minimum must think about items before you do your trip. So you don't need to plan out every minute but there are there are certain key things that you do and it's going to make your your trip a whole lot better as a result yeah i agree you know what i love is i love when i get a a first timer a first time visitor that comes to me and says listen i don't know what i'm doing you do here are the keys take the car out go for a spin that's what yeah. i like because then i can say all right what do you guys like like what, it, what do you like shows is there a certain character you like is there a, t- a ride, a tr- you know, attraction. Do you like roller coasters? Do you like any of that stuff? And then I, you know, I can tailor your trip around those things. And they are the ones I always have people come back to me and say, oh my God, my trip was fantastic. And, but if you, of course you can do this stuff yourself. It just takes some time. What I basically am selling, and I'm, I'm trying not to sell too hard on this podcast. I never try to sell too hard, but it's time, Right. If you use a Disney travel agent, you get all that time that it takes you to plan a trip, you get it back. And that mm-hmm. helps. It really helps. You don't have to obsess over every detail before you get there. Okay. On to my next one. I wanna I this is this is weird because I didn't want this to be a salesy podcast. So I'm gonna try to try not to do that anymore. All right. So one of the things I think that people do, that guests will do, especially people who are new to Walt Disney World, is They want to do the latest and greatest, newest things that Walt Disney World has to offer, right? They want to get, you know, they get down there. They want to get to the, 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 you know, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, or they want to get to even like Princess Fairy Tale Hall and wait. Anna and Elsa aren't there anymore, but wait, you know, those three hours, four hours to meet Anna and Elsa. Meanwhile, there's these classic attractions that don't have weights and people are passing them right by. And I think that's a, Big time rookie mistake. I mean, there's Jungle Cruise never has a super, super long wait, or you can get a fast pass for it if it, if it would. Carousel of Progress, the People Mover, Liberty Square Riverboat, the Grand Fiesta Tour in Epcot in the Mexico Pavilion, uh, even like Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular. These things have been around forever. And the reason they've been around forever is because they're good and you don't want to skip them. You want to do the headliner, sure, but get fast passes for those. You know, get them either later in the day or early in the morning. What I like to do is get them later in the day, my fast passes for my headliners. And then I get to the park when it opens and I do the stuff that doesn't have long lines. I bang all that stuff out so that, that in the later in the day, you do the fast passes. You already know you're doing those big headliners. You don't have to worry about it. But it gives you time to walk through, you know, the Swiss Family Treehouse and it gives you time to buy your Dole now, by the way, and take it into the Enchanted Tiki Room which is very cool that you can eat your Dole Whip in there now. Uh, Life is good. Yes. Yeah, right? Like You've been able to do that at Disneyland for forever because the Dole Whip stand is inside the attraction, which was really weird to me when I got out there. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you have to go <laughs> into the turnstile to get a Dole Whip there. It's strange. But I love that Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom does that now. And yeah, I really wish people would just take their time, make sure you do the headliner, sure, but then do these other ones because I remember, I know so many people that I come home from vacation and I say, oh, what did you think of this? What did you think of that? And they're like, ah, uh, we didn't do that one. I'm like, what? I'm like, there's no line ever. Do it. You have to do these things. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. People see the advertisements on television and the the web ads for the, the new headliners. That's often why people will book their vacation. So Seven Dwarfs Mine Train or Meeting Anna and Elsa. And people want to do that. And like you're saying, they should. They, they absolutely should take in those things. They should use their fast passes to do those things. But there is so much more. And uh, like you say, a lot of these things don't have lines. Some of them you might just stumble upon and you, you will have an amazing experience. You, you might check out some Disney history. You might learn something along the way. Um, and, you know, your, your three fast passes, okay, so maybe there's an hour's worth of your day. There's a whole world of other stuff out there that you can check out. And you mentioned some that I think fit perfectly into that category. So, 
please go on the people mover and check out the carousel of progress. So is the carousel of progress the thing that that every teenager is dying to see when they go to Disney World? No, but it, it is a, a classic attraction with a great story and an amazing technology behind it, even though it's 50, 60 years old, maybe more than that now, uh, from the mid 60s. Uh, check out all of those classics. It, it, it's a good way to spend some of your time. It's a good way to have some fun. And you don't have to wait a ton. You don't have to use your fast passes for it. And and it'll add a lot to your vacation. Yeah, I agree. And you notice neither of us mentioned Stitch's Great Escape on that, on either of our lists. And that yeah. never has a line. You can walk right in. Listen, if you're a big Stitch fan, your kids are big Stitch fans, go do it. But you can only do it during peak times now because it has been downgraded to a seasonal attraction, which means on its way out. <laughs> That's what yes. it really means. Almost without exception, seasonal attraction equals kiss of death. Although exactly. the Carousel of Progress, That's exactly uh, what I was going to say, Carousel of yeah, Progress, escaped that. Which I, I'm happy. I'm very happy about that. You know, I'm a Carousel fan, but I, I think Stitch is not long for this world. No, I agree. Stitch like Stitch's supersonic celebration. It won't be. <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> Stitch lasting this long in that spot is remarkable for the kind yeah. of attraction it is. That's really. the magic of budgets, right there. Yeah, right. It really is. All right, I think you're up, right, Herb, for your next one. Yes. So you mentioned a, a couple of the items already which fall into this category. And I think a rookie mistake is not taking the time to stop and smell the roses. Everywhere you go, there are details. Um, many places you're go- going to go, there are going to be special surprises. And so if you don't stop and enjoy them, you're really going to miss out. So you you already missed you already mentioned one of my favorites, which is the trolley show on Main Street USA. If you are walking down Main Street USA and you start to hear music, stop and watch the show. It it's amazing and it really sets the tone for your day. It sets the tone for Main Street USA. Um, if you're in the Magic Kingdom and you see some people sort of milling around in Frontierland. Um, Check out check out the show that may just sort of form like a, a crowdsourced for a crowdsourced show. Um, the the Muppet Mobile Lab is a great idea. The live entertainment, um, street performance, the treatmosphere in in Disney's Hollywood Studios, all over the place are these things which are not not the big headliners. Nobody's setting up a fast pass to watch the the residents of Hollywood, um, but they are fun and it's a a big part of what makes Disney special. So if you happen by some of these things, don't rush past. Take a few minutes to watch and participate, and you'll be glad that you did. It's really what sets Disney apart. I love this answer. This is one of my favorite things to do in all of Walt Disney World is to slow down. And and we're, you know, you and I are lucky. You're a local. I'm someone, I'm a former local. I'm someone who's there a lot, like weeks and weeks over during the year. So we're very, very privileged, I think, in that way that we get to kind of slow down and do those things but i think you're right it really makes your the the difference in your vacation for what like one thing that you mentioned the trolley show if anyone has anyone's a little younger than me you know probably late 20 or late yeah late 20s early 30s disney used to put out these disney sing-along dvds in the uh late 80s early 90s i think and they had a disneyland it was a dvd called or a cd no cd i'm sorry it was a VHS tape. That's what we had for my sister, my little sister back. My little sister. She's almost thirty. She's getting married. She's not little <laughs> anymore. Uh, but my little sister then had this. It was called Disneyland Fun, and basically there was a, there's a song on there. Welcome right down the middle of Main Street, USA. And I'm not going to sing it. Uh, I Come might, on, but, Phil. You can sing. Go I, ahead. I, I won't. I might. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten you to sing though, but I will not be singing. I will put a clip in here if I remember. Hold on one second. Right here. Okay, so hopefully I remember to put that clip in. If not, you can Google it and find it or go on YouTube. But it's on the DVD and on the VHS tape, it was, it's the song. And it's like a little mini trolley show with the characters. And that is so like stuck in my head. And it's been there for since my sister was a three or four year old that I bought it for my kids and my kids have the DVD and they watch it in a car. And, you know, we've seen it a hundred times. And when this is a little kind of cool piece of Disney magic here, when we were there, my 
uh, six year old, almost six year old Alexa is obsessed, obsessed with that DVD. And she was when she was younger. She was standing on Main Street USA when the trolley show was going on, and she was kind of at the edge of the curb and dancing along and doing all the moves that she remembered from the DVD and that she was watching the dancers do. Well, what do you know? They brought her out into the show, and they got her to be and to be a part of the trolley show on Main Street USA. And they were hugging her and high fiving her, and she thought it was. And she was like in a bell dress, and she thought it was the coolest thing. She thought she was in the show, and that. Those little tiny, like they didn't have to do that, but that made her trip. It made her entire trip. She talked about it. We would say, "What was your favorite thing? Was it Seven Dwarfs Mine Train? Was it Splash Mountain? Was it?" And she was, "No, I like being in a trolley show." And yeah. it's something like that, you know. It's it's very very cool. So yeah, I agree. You got to stop. You got to check those things out. You really do. Do you remember the back in back in the day when they used to have the uh, the old the gunfights on top of the the buildings in Frontierland. I was yeah, like, I do. Oh, I yeah. loved, I loved that. I loved it. I understand now in a very PC society, you can't have that. But I loved when you'd be walking through and there would be Western, you know, cowboys and sheriffs shooting at each other, and it was very, very cool. So, yeah, even though that's not there anymore, there's still plenty, plenty, plenty that you can see when you just kind of slow down and look around. And uh, I think there's one character show that happens in Dino Land, USA. That's like a dance party, and a bunch of like these very uh, rare characters, like Br'er Fox, I remember, and yeah. Br'er, Br'er Rabbit, come out and do like, you know, I think it was the "Watch Me Whip, Watch Me Nene" song. Uh, I I can't. <laughs> That's another one that I, you can see how hip I am, right? Herb? Watch me whip, <laughs> watch me Nene. But uh, yeah, I think they did that, and and all the kids get to go out and dance with them, and it's just such they do such cool things that you would just not ever see if you didn't slow down and look around a little bit. So yeah, I love that pick. Sorry. I know I, I talked way too long on that, but I love that one. No, it's, it's great. I think a lot of these two fall into the live performance category and it's not like you have to, to stand there for th- all 30 minutes of it, you know, just, you right. just take a few minutes and if you really love it, then take a few minutes more, but at least take a, a, a chance to taste what it's all about. Yeah. Completely agree with you. All right. So on to my next one. This is one that has burned me in the past, right? And I think it's something that all parents have to kind of pay attention to. And a big rookie mistake is not checking all all height requirements for every attraction before you go. There are so many websites on you know on the internet that have listed all of the height requirements. There are even some that you can put in your child's height, and it'll tell you exactly what they can't do. So you have to know what your your kids will be able to ride before you go. Because I think the worst thing ever that you could do, not the worst thing ever, literally, but the worst thing you could do before a trip is get your kids excited to ride a certain attraction, get there, wait in the queue for 45 minutes to an hour, get up to the front of the queue, and a cast member says, can I measure your child? Sorry, they're not tall enough to ride. Talk about Tantrum City right there. <laughs> like, you're in that line for 45 minutes, your kid's so excited. They hear the background music. They hear the screams from, from the attraction, say it's Tower of Terror or Expedition Everest. Or, and then you get up there when you're about to get on the ride and they don't get to ride it. Forget it. Forget about having a peaceful rest of your day. It's not going to happen. So I think this is one that people don't often, always not that often, but don't always pay attention to. I've seen people get their kids up there and start getting them on their tiptoes and crazy stuff. We're trying to sneak them past the the uh, cast member so they can't see their height, which is, by the way, extremely dangerous to try to put a kid who's not tall enough on one of the, these attractions. So, yeah. yeah, pay attention. No, don't get your kids excited about an attraction. They can't ride. Listen, in my house, we have a tape measure out every other day. Seriously, I'm not even kidding. For our <laughs> January trip, because our twins are four, and they're just about 40 inches. So as you know, Herb, when you when you hit forty inches, you get so many attractions that you can ride. I mean, you get Soarin', Tower of Terror, Star Tours, Splash Mountain, Thunder Mountain. They're all forty and a you know forty inches and above. So they have watched their sister go on all these attractions the last couple of years, and they can't you know they can't wait to get on them. So they're about right now they're both about a sh- just a little bit under forty. They're like thirty nine and a half like the 39 and three quarters. So 
we have a couple bonds, so I'm hoping by January they make it because they, you know they'll, they'll they'll love riding all this stuff. But yeah, just pay attention to that. I think that's a really really big one. Yeah, you're you're right, and it is a, a safety issue. And my understanding is that safety is the number one thing that cast members deal with, right? Because nobody wants to go to their vacation and get hurt. Disney doesn't want a lawsuit, so they're not doing it to be mean. They're doing it because it's important for safety reasons. But four year olds are not going to get that. So you, this this goes to the planning ahead a little bit. Understand the restrictions for the different rides, and make sure that you're not setting yourself up for a, a big disappointment. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, like I said, you don't want that. That screaming toddler, the screaming four year old or five year old, it's just not worth it. It's, yep. I'm sure you've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. <laughs> it just, it's not something that you want to deal with. So, yeah. Um, all right, Aaron, you're up for your next one. Okay. So, this is something that I, I hear every once in a while. I'm going to Disney World and I want to make sure that I do it all. So, how do I do that? And my answer, quite simply, is you can't <laughs> unless you are planning <laughs> <laughs> or a year. Yeah, yeah really. And, and make sure to mortgage your house in the process. So a, a lot of people are completionists. They want to make sure they see and do everything. You know, it, it's called Walt Disney World for a reason, because it is the size of a world. Yeah. You know, you, you just can't simply do everything. There are too many restaurants. There are too many resorts. There are too many pools. There are too many gift shops. There are too many attractions. There are too many shows. There is too much of everything. And that's good. We, we like having these choices and these options. Uh, but you, you can't go in there thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to be here for four days. This may be the only time I get here in the next few years. I have to see and do it all. Don't set yourself up like that. Realize going in that there will be things that you will miss. And, and it's a good way to, to think about, well, I'll have to catch that the next time I'm able to come back. Don't be disappointed that you can't do it all. Just know going in that you, you simply can't and, and enjoy the things that you can do. Pick the things that you really want to do. And then think about planning another trip to come back and take in some more. Yeah, I agree. I, that's one thing that we try to do as a family every trip is if there's something that you didn't get to do, you you know, you mark it down for the next one. So yeah, with the restaurants, we always have our, you know, top few, our top favorites that we hit almost every trip. But then there's new restaurants that open and you don't get to them. And there's, you know, new, you know, experiences at Disney Springs that you don't get to. And but yeah, especially in the theme parks or if, if it's you haven't been there. You don't. You might not understand the size and the scope of how big everything is on there. I know I didn't before I went as as a kid. It's enormous. I remember going with an uncle after I had been there a couple of times, and he didn't. He on the way down, he didn't get it. And you get on a Disney property, and there, you're on a highway, and he said, "This is Disney," and we're like, "Yeah, like all of this." The theme yeah. parks, the resorts, the, you know, Disney Springs, the wide world of sports, the everything. It's, you have no prayer of doing it all on one trip. So, yep. yeah, just if you kind of temper those expectations a little bit, I think you'll have a lot happier vacation, really. Yep. Agree. Yeah. Good, good call, Herb. Okay. So this, for my next one, I think I, yeah, I have, I have two left. Uh, for my next one, it's, here's one that I, I've written articles about this for, your site, I've written articles about this for my site. I comment on social media posts on this one for people all the time. Because this, for some reason, is a hotly debated topic in the Disney community. And it's the stroller topic. Is it, do we bring a stroller? Do we not bring a stroller? Do we rent strollers or do we skip it? I think not bringing a stroller for your kids is a huge rookie mistake. Listen, a Walt Disney World trip requires tons 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 of walking you not only are you not used to it unless you're a marathon runner your kids aren't used to it at all even if you plan on taking it easy and not going from park open to park close even if you're doing three four five hours in a park a day you're you're not really realizing before you get there just how much walking you're going to do i mean just from parking your car at the magic kingdom to walk to the train and get off the train to walk to the monorail or the or the you know, the boat, then you, you walk off of that through security and you do all this walking before you even get to the front gate of the Magic Kingdom. It's insane. So if you have little kids, they're not going to be prepared for it. They're not going to be ready to do that kind of walking. And they're going to be exhausted before lunch. They're going to be tired. They're going to be cranky. So what we do is we bring umbrella strollers. We have one, you know, we still bring in a, a stroller for our six-year-old. Now, she doesn't use it every day, but she'll use it you know, when we know we're going to be out from park open to park close, we'll bring it 
I'll push it around. She can walk as much as she wants and ride as much as she wants. It's also a good way you throw your bag on top of it if you don't, you know, you don't, if one of the kids aren't using it. And we also bring a double umbrella stroller for the twins. You know, like I said, they're four. They're, they, they can't walk that much. It's just, they just can't. So you can bring your own. What I do is we, we check ours. We gate check ours. We always fly southwest. And you can use it throughout the airport and gate check it. And you get it as soon as you get off your plane. They charge you nothing for it. Uh, or you can rent them from Walt Disney World every day. Or you can rent from one of the third-party vendors uh, that do that down there as well. That will drop off the stroller at your resort on your arrival day. And they'll pick it up on your departure day. It's really nice. I actually prefer that over renting them at Walt Disney World every day. It's less expensive and it's less of a hassle because then you'll have it with you all the time. So yeah, and even if your kid, your kids aren't nappers, they might want to take a nap in the park because it's a long day, and they can take a nap right in the stroller, and you can use that time to, you know, just kind of get a little downtime and walk around with your spouse or significant other. So yeah, I think not bringing your stroller is a is is a big mistake. You're right. This does seem to be one of those controversial topics that comes up in the Disney community where people are very for or very against it. In the world of technology, it's great that people have pedometers now. And I've seen a lot of comments. Average number of miles walked around during a day at a Disney park is is 10 to 15. People um, are wearing out their feet. And and just imagine if your legs were tiny little legs and they had to yeah. walk 10 or 10 or 15 miles. It, it's enough to to wipe out most adults and and more than enough to wipe out most little kids. So I, I, I know a lot of people get um, angry, for lack of a better word, about stroller parking and people getting their shins rolled over and all, all this kind of thing. Um, but for little kids, I think there is a, a definite argument to be made about having a stroller because a, a day is going to be tiring enough in one of the parks in a great way, but it will be tiring with all the walking. And so um, saving some of that is probably a good idea. Uh, yeah, I mean, right. I, I, I agree. And yeah, that's another good point that you raised, too, is that just be mindful of other people with, with other people's ankles and shins because yeah, you can do some damage, especially with those big, heavy plastic Disney strollers, but you know, if you're as long as you're nice and you you apologize, which is the one thing that I see people do, just ramming in the back of people's legs with those things, and not even apologizing, just keep going on their way. Just be courteous. Understand that everyone else there is having the same problem as you. This, this, you know, there are a lot of strollers. The stroller parking gets a little crazy, but to me, it's it's worth putting up with that headache just to ensure that your kids aren't going to be exhausted at the end of the day, and you won't be because you won't be fighting with them half the day because they're going to, you know, I've seen the kid at, you know, one, two, three o'clock just laying on the ground and their parents are trying to pick them up <laughs> and they're screaming and they're like, no, no, no. You don't want to be, you don't want that. You're going to have a good time. You're going yep. to Disney and have a good time. You don't want that experience, you know? So yeah, bring the stroller. It's a good idea. We'll rent them. You know, it's, that's good as well. All right, Agreed. you're up for your, for your next or la- is it your last one? I think this is my last one. All righty. Hit us with it. One thing I think it's important, all the things we talked about are around expectations. So kind of knowing what you're getting into before you get into it. And one of the things that I think really, really exemplifies that, if I can use my SAP word, uh, is understanding the crowd levels. So you don't want to be there on New Year's Eve thinking, you know, we'll just go in around four or five and then we'll catch the fireworks. (laughs) Right. Not going to happen. So understand what the crowd levels are like. There are plenty of free crowd calendars on the Internet, or you can sign up for one of the paid ones, which will give you a ranking of how busy the parks are going to be. Now, Disney Smart Business, they do a lot to make sure that the parks are as full as possible for as much of the year as possible. Um, All the food and wine festivals and flower and garden and races, they're doing a lot to make sure that there aren't really slow times. There are just uh, busy times and busier times. But if you're going to go at a really busy time, summertime, um, between Christmas and New Year's, Easter or spring break, there are going to be lots of people there. And it's going to have to change your expectation and how you go about your vacation. Um, If you're going on Christmas Day and the parks are a 10 out of 10 and they may close down that park because it has reached capacity, don't think that you're going to take in your favorite 15 attractions. Um, Make sure that you set your expectation based on the crowd levels 
And those are times when if you do want to go on Christmas Day and it's a 10 out of 10 and maybe you you were able to get a couple fast passes, uh, think differently about what your day is going to be like. Um, Enjoy the the details, uh, take in the decorations, walk around and grab a snack and don't blow your top when you have to wait 15 minutes to use the restroom. So understanding the crowd levels, I think is really important. And then adjusting your idea of what your day is going to be like. Um, you, you just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. Yeah, you're right. Herb. And, and that's one thing too, that uh, I'll do is I subscribe to those, uh, those crowd calendars and I look and I'll tell you, what I think your best days to go and worst days to go would be. And I also tell you as a part of my service, like, okay, look, this is projected to be a four in animal kingdom this day. So make this day your animal kingdom day. And okay, this day is a seven at magic kingdom. So make this day your magic kingdom day. It's just, it makes sense to kind of understand what the crowds are going to be or what they're projected to be. But you're also right about the holiday. If you're going on Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, Christmas, if you're going on one of those days, you're right. You have to have to set the expectations, you know, correctly. Like, don't think you're right. You're not going to ride 15 things. What I would recommend if you're going on Christmas Day, if you're going on New Year's, Thanksgiving, just enjoy being in the park on that day. Yeah. Know that you're in Walt Disney World. You're there with the Christmas music. You're there with, you know, the countdown to to the new year. You're there. Enjoy it. Enjoy, enjoy you know, the things that as we were saying in the other on the other parts of the list, when you you know take the time to look up, look down, look around, enjoy your surroundings, you would have you're you're gonna have a much better time. And don't drink a huge soda <laughs> at Magic <laughs> Kingdom and then wait to go to the bathroom. Because you're right, those lines amazingly can get that long. I've seen it. I've been there on Thanksgiving and I remember waiting at the restroom in front of the Magic Kingdom there. And I, I remember the, the line being out the door. And for, you know, as guys, we have it easy. Our lines are barely, they're never out the door for any restroom. And yep. the poor women, whenever I go to a sporting event or somewhere in Walt Disney World, especially the Disney races, they always have the longest lines. They're, you know, a hundred people more, you know, longer than the men's lines are. So, but yeah, I, I'm not kidding about that. Don't get <laughs> an enormous fountain soda and then go ride an attraction and then say, oh, I think I have to go to the bathroom. You're going to be waiting a while. <laughs> it's it's true. You you can wait 15 minutes to get into a bathroom. It's crazy. I remember there's a really cool story about Walt Disney when Disneyland opened. They had pay toilets in some of the restrooms. Some of them were you know free, and some of them were pay toilets. I guess people who were really willing to go ahead of line would use the pay toilets. Well, Walt was in you know went through there one day, and all the pay to- toilets were empty. And there was this long line to get in the other bathroom, you know, the other stalls. And that next day he was like, get rid of the pay toilets. Doesn't make any sense. We're making all these people unhappy who are waiting to use the bathroom. And the pay toilets are sitting there unused. Just get rid of them. I don't know why I thought of that, but (laughs) it's an interesting Walt Disney tidbit anyway. Um, I never knew that before I learned something new today. Yeah, I know. Isn't it weird that they had pay toilets in Disneyland? I never thought, I remember reading that and being like, that's a strange concept to me. I didn't know that even existed ever, but. Yeah, sure enough, that was a part of Disneyland in 55, so it's pretty cool. Wow. All right, so on to my number one or my number one rookie mistake. And this one, as a travel agent, kind of drives me crazy. It's not knowing which tickets to buy. Now, a lot of people don't understand just how many options there are when picking your tickets for a Walt Disney World vacation, because there are a lot. And if you don't know what they are inside and out, you might end up spending more money than you need to. And listen, if you're going to just be doing one park per day, you know you have to understand that there's people, and a lot of people, Disney especially, are going to try to sell you the park hopper uh, option. It might not be the best option for you. You might not need it. You know, should you buy base tickets? Should you buy the park hopper? Should you buy the water park and more option, which allows you to go to the water park pretty much every day if you'd like to? You, if you're going on a trip and you're going to the water park one day, you don't need the water park and more option. You just don't. You pay out of pocket for that one day. It saves you some money, you know, ultimately in the long run. So it's up to the indiv- individual taking the trip to, to decide which options they want for their tickets. But it, 
I just don't want to see people make the mistake of paying for things that they're not going to use. If you have little kids, like little, little kids, you might not be park hopping. You might not need that. You know, so I really want people to, to, to if you're listening to this, to think, what do we need? What do we really need before the trip? Because you might want just base tickets or you might want the the quick service dining plan instead of the, you know, deluxe dining plan or the standard dining plan. Because you might not want to sit down and take the time for a table service restaurant, you know, once a day. It makes a lot of sense to, to really explore your options really look at what's customizable in the ticket package and go from there. Because I don't, the last thing I want to do is, is see people spending all this money and then coming home and being like, well, I bought this, but I didn't get to utilize it. I bought you know the park hopper. We only park up one day. I bought the, the deluxe dining plan with the counter service every meal. So really you should know going in just exactly what you're going to need for that trip. I'm glad you saved this one for last. It's really the the cherry on the cake. So you you or the Sunday or whatever sweet treat you want to to put it put, on. You can put cherries on anything. It makes it better. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can tell me if you you feel differently about this, Phil. But I I often tell people the worst time and the worst place to buy tickets is at the uh, the entrance on your first day. Yep. So you you don't want to go in there not knowing um, what you want to buy because there are a lot of options. You, you need to understand what they are and whether or not they fit for you. And if you buy at the gate, you are guaranteed going to pay the highest price and you're going to wait in a long line for the privilege to do it. And you're going to have to make all these decisions with a big line behind you feeling a lot of pressure. Take the time before you get there to figure out what tickets make the most sense for you and realize that you don't have to buy all of those things up front. There are things that you can add on if you need to. Um, So getting some advice on the best ticket option that makes the most sense for you in advance, I think, is a really important tip. Uh, And and don't don't wait and put it off to buy it at the gate. And I know fewer and fewer people do that with packages and all all of that sort of thing. But this one is a good way to encapsulate a lot of the things that we talked about and making sure you do some homework that you um, have planned ahead. Uh, and and that you you're you're doing the thing that makes the most sense and get some get some help to do that. Yeah, I can remember on on my first trip, we stayed off property, and my family, my mom, my dad, and, and you know, and all the kids, we bought our tickets at the front of Magic Kingdom on the first day that we got there. Now back then, they were the paper tickets that remember you would have the hole punch per day when you went in. Yeah, uh, the, you know, it was very low tech, but I remember that line being long then at you know the front of the park. Now, because so many people are there waiting for other things, because they used to have this self-pay kiosk there. They got rid of them. I'm not sure why. I, I really like that idea. But maybe it was yeah. just, they were more of a headache than, they were, than, you know, than it was worth for Disney to maintain them. But now, with all the issues with... It's getting better, but with My Magic Plus and with the Fast Passes and with the, the Magic Bands and with issuing tickets to certain people, you know, as far as that technology goes, that line's going to be long. And you don't want to have to wait at that guest relations line. And, and, you know, you're all excited. You get to the park. And like you said, you're, you're like, oh, well, we don't have tickets. Then you have to wait a half hour. You're hot. You're annoyed. And then you get up there. And if you don't know exactly what you want, that's a lot of pressure. There, and there's a couple hundred more really annoyed people, you know, guests behind you waiting to do the same thing that you're doing. Yeah, it's not a good way to do it. So I think you're, you hit that right in the head. You got to. You just have to do the research or have someone else do the research for you. And, you know, just because it's, there are a lot of options. You don't want to pay for stuff that you don't, you're not going to use or you're not going to take full advantage of. That's for sure. Yeah. You made a bunch of good points in there. So I, I, I think a lot of people think buying a ticket to get into uh, the magic kingdom is a lot like buying a ticket to go watch a movie at your local, your local cinema. Not, not the same. So a lot of options, a lot of choices. Uh, the, the self-service kiosks, I always found those interesting too. I, I very, when they existed, I very rarely saw anybody using them. And I always wondered why. It's like, well, people use the ATMs. Why don't they use these self-service kiosks? Especially when there's a long line just 10 feet away to talk to a person. But I think that also speaks to the fact that you know, this this is not like buying a ticket to go in and right. see a movie. This is a, a, an expensive decision. Um, it's a, a somewhat complicated decision. It's one that's going to vary depending on your family and your circumstance and your the way you want to do things. And I, I think a lot of that probably led to the death of 
those self-service kiosks, plus the, the ability to plan more in advance and um, now be able to buy it on your phone even. Um, but yeah, don't don't leave this to the end. Don't leave this just to, to making decisions at the last minute. And I, I think this is a great way to end the show in, in making sure that you spend some time to get the tickets in advance that match your needs. Yeah, I completely agree that you, you don't, like we said, it's, you're exactly right. It, it isn't like buying a ticket to a movie, which maybe <laughs> that's why I, that's how I buy my tickets to movies or I buy them on my phone now before I get there and just scan it as I walk in. Right. But you're right. You really can't do that at Walt Disney World. There are too, there's just way too many options now. There's way too many little things that you have to check off. And yeah, you're right. That probably did lead to the death of those kiosks. But man, that I like walking up to them when people were standing there, all those people in line. <laughs> And being like, I don't, when I was a, when I was a local, um, they weren't there. And I remember being, thinking it when I was there for a trip being like, man, if I just walk right up and buy my ticket, walk right in. It's awesome. But yeah, it's not, it's, you're right. It, it probably wasn't the best idea, but I'm all right here. Well, thank you again for, for recording with me. And these are always fun. And I think, I hope we gave people a lot to kind of think about. This is, I think it was a, it's a good one. It's an informative, uh, podcast for people who really, you know, want to, if you're going for the first time, I think this will be a really, really helpful one. Yeah, I always have a good time when I'm able to come on the show. I appreciate the invitation, Phil. And, and I hope people do learn a few things along the way. I learned something about pay toilets. So you, you, you can always learn something from the Ear to Their podcast. And the Disney, the, the nerd here that read way too many Disney history books. But so, <laughs> all right, Herb. So thanks. So if, if anybody wants to, and they should, by the way, go over to uh, to learn more about you and, and listen to your podcast and read your articles where should they go so the place to check out is worldofwalt.com most articles uh come out every day well a new article comes out most every weekday um also check me out on facebook.com slash world of walt uh, there's a lot of posting going on there live videos uh, that's where it all happens worldofwalt.com yeah saturday mornings look for herb in the in the parks that's always fun for me because i get to go online and and pester the poor guy as he's trying to walk around and show people parts of the park so uh, harangue is the word i was going to yeah, use Phil. harangue gonna, that's yeah. right there's going to be a challenge every week and whether you choose to accept it or not they're going to be laying the gauntlet down for you so <laughs> thanks a lot her thanks again for coming on it was a lot of fun i'm looking forward to the next one thank you phil And that is going to do it for this week's episode of the Ear to There podcast. Thank you so much once again to my guest, Herb Leibacher. It's always fun to have Herb on the show. This is a good topic. I love talking about these kinds of things. So I think it'll really help people when they're taking their next trip to Walt Disney World. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, just like I hope you enjoy each and every episode that I put out there. And all I ask is if you did enjoy the episode, please tell someone about it. Tell that family that you know from your neighborhood who are thinking about taking their first ever trip to Walt Disney World with the kids. I think this episode could really help them out. And as always, please feel free to share any of these episodes on your favorite social media sites. And just remember, there will be a new episode of the Ear to Their podcast each and every Monday morning, as well as a brand new episode of the Ear to Their podcast, Walt Disney World, Word of the Week each and every Wednesday morning. So thank you so much again for listening. Until next time, have a great week. Bye-bye. Here to thirst.